bear with me. Um, there are so many memories that I have in this building. Um, and there's so much that this building stands for before the Civil Rights Movement that most people in this room cannot imagine. Uh, St. Augustine was a wonderful place to grow up in. My father had friends of every sort, Jewish friends that he invested with, uh, Christian friends, he had, he had black friends, he had poor friends, he had snowbird friends. And when he built this building, he said, I will not participate in segregation. My father was from Latin America. I don't know how many of you realize that. He said, I will not participate in segregation. He had a specialty which was new in America at the time. He trained in, at Tufts University Forsyth Dental Infirmary for uh, maxillofacial surgery, which meant that if you were in an automobile accident and your head got all broken up, or if you were in prison and somebody hit you with a crowbar, or in Vietnam, whatever, <laughs> you could not be treated by anyone except him because he was the only one in the entire state of Florida and lower Georgia. So everybody came to him if they wanted to get fixed. I have a copy in here under his picture of the letter giving him hospital privileges in order to do surgery. He was the first black doctor in the state of Florida to get hospital privileges. Imagine being a surgeon and not having hospital privileges. So the prisons had a room for him where he operated there. The agricultural people down in the, in the orange picking areas had places for him to operate there. But in St. Augustine, this hospital, as they were in Washington, D.C., until the 60s, were segregated. So if there was not a black hospital, if there was not a black hospital or a white hospital with a segregated uh, ward for children or a segregated ward for adults, but no privileges for the doctors, then the doctor could operate in the black hospital. St. Augustine had no black hospital. So daddy built this building and had his own operating rooms in here, and he also operated at Flagler. And the letter, the copy of the letter is in here so that you can read it. Now, this building is also significant because this is the waiting room. And it, if you came to see Dr. Gordon, you're gonna have to sit next to whoever else came to see Dr. Gordon. Because he wasn't going to have a white waiting room and a black waiting room. And in my uncle's case, who, uh, who practiced in North Carolina, there was three-way segregation. Indian, black, and white. And Daddy said, I will have an integrated practice in a segregated era. So the sheriff sat right here, and right next to him might be a domestic. And right next to him might be a white teacher. And right next to her might be a black man who mowed on. He did not care. If you were coming to see him, you were going to have to sit in here. And one of the best, I get goosebumps, one of the best sermons I ever heard in my life, and I hope you will remember it, was a minister in Washington who said, would that we could all love each other the way people do in the ICU waiting room. <laughs> because any of you who've been in there know, knows that when you're in there, you're scared. And you don't care who is next to you, they hug you, and you hug them, and you say prayers together. You love each other beyond whatever goes on here on earth. Now, I spent a lot of my childhood in this building because I was daddy's assistant. <laughs> and I would go to the bank and do his banking, and I'd come back, and I'd have lunch with him. And I have to tell you one story I told Gwen. Should I tell that? Yes, you can. Because you might think it's easy. A man's making a lot of money. He's got snowbird friends. All of the East Coast snowbirds were buddies from Pittsburgh, Richard Mellon, um, from Washington, from New York, from Philadelphia, whomever, they were his patients 
and they were his friends. And I still am friends with some of them, with their children. At any rate, I'm here one day, and I'm probably 12 years old, and I've just come back from the bank, and I've brought Daddy his lunch, and I've brought his assistant her lunch, and a lady who, a white lady who had just had, um, we just had surgery, <laughs> said, and the anesthesia was wearing off, said that she felt kind of light at it. And um, so his assistant said, well, uh, Daddy said to the assistant, take her in the lounge, which is the far room at the back on the left. Take her in the lounge and let her stretch out on the sofa <laughs> until we have lunch. And then when she feels better, she can go leave at the end of the hall. So we did what we were doing, and the assistant did what she was doing. And then he said, OK, honey, it's time for lunch. So he called me the Duchess. OK, Duchess, let's go have lunch. And so we went to the back room, opened the door to his lounge, and there was the patient, completely naked, lying on the sofa. <laughs> My father was a very reserved man. He was, he was educated in England from the age of seven. I never saw him cry, and I never saw him lose his temper. He said, Madam, please put your clothes on. I, um, I don't know whether you're trying to get me lynched, <laughs> uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. And this is my daughter, and I prefer that she not have to see this. So would you please put your clothes on, always looking at the floor, and leave quietly if you're feeling better. If you're not feeling better, please let my assistant know, and we'll make other arrangements. <laughs> so, I got an education in this building, it's all I'm telling her. <laughs> she got up, she put her clothes on, and she left, and then we went back in the, in the lounge, and we sat down, we had our lunch, and we went on with the day. Um, people had to cope with things in those days, all kinds of things. Some things were great. My violin teacher was white, she lived over on the beach, I love her to death. Uh, my second violin teacher was white. She was from New Bedford. Um, we had dinner with her in Washington when the Jacksonville Symphony came. I played with the Jacksonville Symphony when I was 11 years old in Jacksonville. Um, my ballet teacher was also white. He was from New York. He did not observe segregation. So don't think there's any one story. There are about 15,000 stories in St. Augustine. And it's the most wonderful town, as far as I'm concerned, on the face of the earth. Thank you for listening.